This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Let's see the device itself. As the resident neuroscientist, I often have family members asking me for my thoughts on interesting new neurofocused products and news. Think things like nootropics, new age therapies, and wearable neuro devices. Folks are wondering if buying these products might be beneficial for protecting their brain health. Usually my response is pretty consistent. The best way to protect your brain health is to get regular exercise, eat a healthy diet, and maintain a fulfilling life with hobbies and socialization. I know that's a boring answer, but it's by far the most scientifically proven method. Most of the time, these pricey neuro products tooted as being good for your brain are backed by shaky data at best and misinformation and homeopathy at worst. But that doesn't mean it's all fake. Some substances, like caffeine and nicotine, do have demonstrable effects on cognition, while mindfulness meditation and being around nature do seem to be good for your mental health. So I got to thinking, what if some of those fancy neurotech devices actually work? And if they do, how do they do it? I decided that I wanted to test one out for myself. I started poking around on the internet, googling terms like wearable neurotech and neuro devices, and I stumbled onto Apollo Neuroscience, a new-ish company that's building a wearable device that purports to relieve stress, improve focus, reduce the likelihood of depression, and even hasten athletic recovery and improve symptoms of anxiety disorders like PTSD. That's a lot of power in a little box that you strap to your wrist or ankle. Intrigued, I started reading up on the science behind the device. According to the Apollo Neuroscience website, the story goes like this. Doctors David Rabin and Greg Siegel were colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh in the program in Cognitive Effective Neuroscience. They were studying the relationship between a physiological phenomenon called heart rate variability, or HRV, and how it's related to emotional arousal and stress. They also started looking at how certain non-invasive vibration patterns can affect our parasympathetic nervous system and, in turn, impact our HRV. In 2018, they created a device that could deliver specific patterns of vibration to the skin that were linked to a healthy HRV and have since moved to make the device commercially available. As someone who lives with anxiety and depression, I wanted to try it out. I mean, why not? If it works, then it's a new tool to help me manage my symptoms. So I reached out to the company to try and set up an interview with one of their scientists about the device and to ask whether or not I could try one myself. While the interview didn't work out, they did send me an Apollo device. To be totally transparent, they sent me the device for free in exchange for my honest opinion. They're not paying me and they could request that I send the device back at any time. So you're getting my honest, unfiltered opinion. A few days after contacting the Apollo team, my device arrived in the mail and I was ready to try it out for the first time. Okay, so the Apollo device arrived the other day. The box it came in was really beat up, so I already took it out of the shipping box, but we have the Apollo device, which is, the box is smaller than I was expecting. We have their informational inserts. Frequently asked questions. This really entertained me when I pulled this out of the box. How often should I use Apollo? To get started, we recommend using Apollo for a minimum of two hours a day for 30 days. That's 3,600 minutes if you're tracking in the app. You can definitely use it more if you like. Though many notice Apollo's effects soon after starting a mode, it can take up to 30 days of regular use to realize consistent changes in how you feel. Um, it also has a whole day's worth of suggested use. You can use mindfulness and meditation, rebuild and recover, clear and focus, social and open, relax and unwind, sleep and renew. So all day, basically, it tells you to wear this device all day. All right, so let's see the device itself. is connecting to my Apollo. Let's try it out. Turn it on for the first time. Pair. All right. It kind of feels like if I had a slightly pulsing electric toothbrush and held it against my wrist. It's like 
going in like waves. Can you hear it? Does it make noise? Yeah. Can you put it up to the microphone? It's, it feels unbalanced to have it on just one side because it's like a pretty strong vibration. Like I can feel it throughout my hand and my wrist. So it feels weird to just have it on the one side and not on the other. So it just feels kind of distracting. But it might be a little bit less weird on the ankle. We'll see. So let's back up. I wanna talk more about this heart rate variability thing and what we know about its connection to our emotional state. Until I learned about the Apollo device, I'd never heard of HRV, which it turns out is actually pretty surprising. Apparently, this biomarker is an important physiological indicator of health. HRV isn't about your heart rate. It's about the variation in time between each heartbeat. When you're going about your day, your heart rate isn't always steady. Your heart will pump faster if you're out for a run or climbing steep stairs, and it'll pump slower when you're watching a relaxing movie or reading in bed. Our bodies need to be able to quickly change our heart rate to accommodate whatever activity we're currently doing. If you find yourself suddenly needing to, uh, I don't know, sprint down a long tunnel so you don't get crushed by a giant boulder, your heart needs to be able to quickly speed up its pumping so you can get all that good, good oxygenated blood to all your limbs and brain. So having a high HRV is a good thing. It's a marker of a healthy cardiovascular system that's ready and able to adjust its activity as needed. Studies in the 80s showed that HRV was a predictor for whether or not a person would die following a heart attack. Those with higher HRVs were more likely to survive. HRV is also, according to doctors, a good marker of stress and how well your body can handle it. That change in heart rate is controlled by the autonomic nervous system, which is the body-wide network that controls mostly unconscious bodily functions. Within the autonomic nervous system are the sympathetic nervous system, which is mostly known for its role in the fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which controls feed and breed activities. So, Activating the sympathetic nervous system gets you wired up and ready to go, while activating the parasympathetic nervous system helps you wind down and chill out. This is probably why HRV has become so big in certain fitness communities, especially CrossFit. While I'm mostly focusing on HRV's relationship to mental health in this video, there's a lot of evidence that high HRV is connected to improved athletic performance and recovery after injury. In fact, a lot of things that are good for you are associated with higher HRV, like good sleep habits, mindfulness meditation, healthy diet, and regular exercise. All right, it's uh, first week back at work in 2021. National news has been kind of a bummer today, and I'm having a hard time focusing on work. So we're gonna give this Apollo a try, see if it helps me focus up a little bit. Part of me kind of is feeling like, you know, just the intentional act of like putting on the device and starting it might be part of this, right? Because it's like a very conscious choice to put it on and turn it on. So maybe that's like part of what the effects are, but I don't know, we'll see how I feel. Right now it's starting the clear and focused session. So 30 minutes at 40% intensity. We'll see if it actually helps me get focused or if it's just a losing battle. We'll find out. Some research has linked HRV to mental well-being too. The argument goes that external factors that stress you out send your fight or flight response into overdrive, making it really hard for your body to balance itself and recover from stress. A higher HRV means your body is more stable and more capable of regulating its response to external influences. Some research backs this up. In studies where participants were exposed to stressful challenges in the lab, people who had higher HRVs were more flexible and adaptable to emotional stressors. Basically, they were more resilient. Studies have linked low HRV to increasing feelings of depression and anxiety. And individuals with clinical or subclinical anxiety and depression have been found to have lower HRVs when compared to controls. Other studies have connected low HRV to schizophrenia, antipsychotic use, and PTSD. It seems like a sort of chicken or the egg situation. It's not totally clear what comes first, low HRV or mental illness. All right, I put the Apollo on this morning. 
I always kind of hate putting it on because I don't want to wear it as a bracelet because then it'll get in the way of my typing. But if I wear it as an anklet, then I feel like I'm wearing a house arrest anklet, which is no fun. But right now I'm trying the energy and wake up setting. So it's gonna wake me up. So the energize and wake up setting just finished. And I will say that it definitely leaves me, like my leg feeling like kind of tingly because the energize and wake up pulses are like really strong and fast. You know, if you feel like you've been holding on to something that's vibrating a lot and then afterward when you let go, you can like still feel it in your hands. So, I mean, it definitely leaves a lingering impression. What's interesting to me is that there's not a lot of solid information available on whether or not increasing HRV is connected to improved mental health. Some studies have examined the effects of HRV biofeedback, which involves being hooked up to a machine that tracks your heart rate and HRV and using breathing techniques and thinking about positive emotions to try and maximize your HRV. To me, it sort of sounds like a mindfulness exercise. It basically forces you to focus on your breathing so you're not so focused on the stuff that's stressing you out, which in turn helps increase your HRV. HRV biofeedback use has been connected to a reduction of self-reported stress and anxiety, as well as improved symptoms of chronic pain and fibromyalgia. Among other things, I'm focusing on the brain stuff. But it's important to note that self-reported feelings of stress and anxiety aren't the same as clinical improvement. I haven't really been able to find much data that includes clinical assessment of symptoms following HRV biofeedback training. One interesting note is the relationship between the vagus nerve and HRV. Stimulation of the vagus nerve lowers the heart rate and increases HRV, and vagal nerve stimulation has been used as a treatment for otherwise treatment-resistant depression. So there's at least one line of therapy that points to a connection between HRV and alleviating symptoms of depression. But vagal nerve stimulation is pretty invasive and has effects on the whole autonomic nervous system, not just HRV. So I've been trying to use this Apollo device regularly, but it's definitely hard to like remember to keep it on all the time. Um, when it is on, sometimes I do forget that it's on and then I forget to use the settings, but uh, haven't found that any of the settings like have a strong enough impact that I notice that I like am really motivated to like keep using it, keep putting it on. I've been trying to use it when I like do my mindfulness in the mornings. I do like the like energize and wake up setting just because like it is this like very strong vibrational setting that like definitely kind of perks your attention. But I don't know if it's like because the vibrations themselves are like actually energizing or if it's just like having some kind of like vibrant stimulus when you're trying to wake up in the morning. Finally, I found at least one study that compared three different approaches for reducing stress, physical activity, mindfulness meditation, and HRV biofeedback. The study found that each of these activities reduced stress, but there was no difference between the three, suggesting that all three of these treatments are about equally effective at alleviating feelings of stress. Even though the data still seems kind of spotty to me, there are plenty of folks working on using HRV biofeedback to help treat mental illness. Apparently, it's being used in people with PTSD to help alleviate symptoms, and there are all kinds of breathing technique resources out there designed to help with stress and anxiety. This isn't that surprising. When I think about my own response to stress, or when I'm starting to feel my anxiety spiral, one of the most effective techniques for snapping out of it is to stop what I'm doing, close my eyes, and take several long, deep breaths. While HRV biofeedback and resonant breathing include specific techniques, they're fairly similar in their goal, slowing down your breathing and helping you focus your mind. How's it been going with the Apollo device? Uh, fine. So right now I have it on the clear and focused setting and it sort of just feels like a cat purring. You, like, you really have to like use it a lot, apparently, to like get the full benefit. And how have you been doing with uh, meeting that level? <laughs> I haven't. Really? Uh, no, I mean, I don't like wearing it on my wrist very much because it's in the way when I'm working and then wearing it on my ankles in the way if I'm like putting on my shoes and stuff and it's just, you know, it's just like one more thing to have to remember to do. So mm -hmm. I haven't been great about it. So maybe if I were, it would be more beneficial. But again, like all these other reviewers were like, oh my God, it's amazing within like a couple days of using it. So. Mm. Okay, so we've established that higher HRV is associated with improved emotional regulation and stability, and low HRV seems to be connected with depression and anxiety. We've even found some evidence that techniques that increase HRV are associated with reduced feelings of stress. But the connection might not be so direct. 
Correlation is not the same as causation. After all, some research has found that using antidepressants is associated with a lower HRV, even though these drugs are meant to treat depression. And other studies have found that some activities, like looking at fish in an aquarium, improve feelings of stress and anxiety, but don't seem to have an effect on HRV. So the relationship seems to be kind of complicated. But let's get back to this bracelet. What do these vibrations have to do with anything? The Apollo device claims to use clinically tested vibration patterns that are proven to optimize HRV, all bundled into a little wearable device to deliver a big mental punch in a small package. So, okay, here's what Apollo says about their device. Apollo vibrations feel like waves coming and going. This sensation feels natural because it is. Apollo's modes match a natural oscillation pattern between our heart and our lungs when we deep breathe, which consistently improves HRV in lab trials and in real-world use. When our bodies feel the rhythm of the Apollo vibrations, it is automatically recognized by the body as soothing, gentle touch, just like a friend giving you a hug on a bad day. As we discussed in our video about touch deprivation, our sense of touch is a really important sensory system, and it conveys a lot of information to our brains. On their website, Apollo points to some studies on the effects of vibration, both whole body and hand transmitted. Research on whole body vibration has found that at certain frequencies, it can increase oxygen uptake, heart rate, blood pressure, and perceived exertion during mild physical activity, such as holding a squat position or turning an arm crank. When it comes to the effects of vibration on HRV, it seems like most of the studies are pretty small, but the results are interesting. One study with 60 adult male participants found that exposing people to different frequencies of vibration during simulated driving had a dramatic effect on both their HRV and their perceived fatigue. Another study in 20 subjects, male and female, found that exposure to a specific hand-transmitted vibration led to reduced total HRV compared to no vibration. Apollo used these studies to inform their design of vibration patterns intended to increase energy levels and alertness, because basically that vibration was stressing the participants out and kind of making it harder for them or more work for them to do what they were doing. So the idea was kind of like making them more alert. Apollo also points to other studies focused on specific patterns of breathing for relaxation and meditation. And from what I can gather, the creators have turned that information into wave-like vibration patterns intended to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Since they don't cite specific studies on the relationship between vibration exposure and these states, my guess is that the vibration patterns mimic the intended breathing rhythm, acting as a silent encouragement for your body to drop into a more calm state. But it's not clear to me if that's what's actually happening. Wait, what were you saying? The thing that I'm really struggling to figure out yeah. is that it feels like they make a lot of leaps from like concept to concept in order to justify why a vibrating bracelet is gonna help your mental health. So it essentially is arguing that like this this high HRV is associated with well-being, including mental well-being, and that you can get this high HRV through these different techniques that are known to like increase your HRV. But then they're also making this argument that like vibration can improve your HRV, except none of the data that I'm looking at really says anything about vibration specifically. Maybe I'm just like missing something in terms of data about how like certain vibration patterns are associated with feelings of like comfort and safety. But it's like a lot of leaps from idea to idea to idea that like are trying to connect these things together. I just don't feel like the connections are as clear as they're making them out to be. They could be very clear, but without the original data to show that, it's really hard for me to know. Like they say that their studies have shown this, but like, where's the study, you know? See, although Apollo loves to toot the effectiveness of their device, I found it hard to actually find any peer-reviewed results demonstrating that these specialized vibration patterns have a demonstrable effect on HRV, stress, or mood. In one study, they had 38 participants do a deliberately stressful cognitive test while receiving either the Apollo vibrations, placebo vibrations, or no vibration. David Rabin presented a talk where he shared data indicating that the Apollo vibrations dramatically increased HRV in just a few minutes, and participants reported feeling calmer and their accuracy on the test improved. Unfortunately, his results don't seem to have been published in any scientific journals yet, so they come with the important caveat that other scientists haven't reviewed the data and analysis. 
This isn't always a huge issue, but because Dr. Rabin and his research team have a financial stake in convincing people that their device increases HRV, it's important that their results be confirmed by other scientists. In another study, the Apollo device was used by 40 athletes at the University of Minnesota to support their physical recovery and athletic performance. The Apollo website states that all 40 athletes saw increased HRV and showed more rapid recovery after physical exercise. But weirdly, that's the only place I could find this information. I couldn't find a link to a paper, so I have no idea what their data actually shows. The same thing is true for another study where the Apollo device was tested with a handful of kids who displayed a variety of neurodevelopmental differences, like ADHD and autism. According to Apollo, all patients showed behavioral improvement, but I can't find the data to back that up. And another study on using Apollo to reduce stress in nurses? Supposedly it helps, but where's the data? This device is still pretty new, so it could just be that they haven't had an opportunity to publish their data yet. But in the era of free open access publishing platforms like BioArchive and MedArchive, it's kind of weird to me that they haven't publicly shared their data while arguing that their device is scientifically validated. Regardless, the Apollo team is going full steam ahead. They have ongoing clinical trials on whether Apollo can make meditation easier, and if it can be used to improve symptoms of PTSD. And of course, you can buy your very own Apollo device for the low, low price of $350. If you Google Apollo reviews, people seem to love them. Lots of folks talk about how helpful the device was for meditation and that they felt it helped their mood and energy levels. So when the folks at Apollo offered to send me my own device to test out, I was pretty excited. While I've got a pretty good system going with medication, therapy, and my own meditation practice, I'm always interested in new tools for managing my mental health. But overall, I'd have to say, it doesn't really seem to be my cup of tea. I did find it to be kind of energizing when I was first starting my day and put it on the wake up setting, but I didn't find that it had an especially dramatic effect on me otherwise, to the point that I would either often forget that I had it on and thus forget to use it, or I'd only be focused on how uncomfortable or in the way it was, like when I was trying to put on my boots. I wonder if some of this is because I already have a lot of tools I use for many similar purposes. Like when I'm meditating, I usually use an app that provides some light, calm background music to help ground and guide me, so I didn't really feel like the vibrations added much. I wonder if maybe I just didn't focus on the device enough. I found it almost impossible to use as much as the guide said I should, because I actually found it kind of distracting to use. I had to remember I had it on, I had to go into the app, I had to choose a setting, and then choose another setting later if I wanted a different vibration pattern. It's a lot of steps and a lot of time. But I could also see how the mindfulness of accessing the device and picking a setting could help set the right tone for some people. I'm not sure if Apollo is gonna want the device back, but if they don't, I'm gonna try and keep using it. It really might be a habit thing, and maybe with more time and use, it'll start to feel more natural and helpful. And if it is, I'll have to give an update here and let you know how it goes. That said, I don't think you need to be running out to spend $350 on this device right now. It's probably better to focus on the habits the device is intended to support, like mindfulness meditation and physical exercise, rather than buying a fancy vibrating bracelet. Or at least hold off until we see some of those published peer-reviewed data showing that the device is really helpful. If you want to learn more about the neurotech of the future, you should read our book, which is available for pre-order now. Brains Explained will publish on June 22nd, 2021, and we would so love for you to put in a pre-order. Those orders will help boost our book's visibility online and will help new brainiacs find us more easily and learn about their big, beautiful brains. The link is in the description, and if we can manage to sell 5,000 pre-order copies, we'll actually be on the New York Times bestsellers list. A girl can dream. One thing I was struck by while writing today's video is how couching things with scientific language can make it sound like something is evidence-based, when the evidence is still pretty thin. And I'm grateful for my training as a scientist for helping me learn how to watch out for those traps. Luckily, even if you're not in the lab, there are tools for that, like Brilliant. Brilliant offers detailed and in-depth math and science enrichment courses, providing you with opportunities to learn new concepts by applying them directly to problems and helping you learn to think like a scientist. 
In fact, they have a whole learning path called Science Foundations that will introduce you to how to think scientifically and guide you through key concepts in physics, chemistry, and engineering, all the while using puzzles and problem solving so you can have fun learning. To get started on your own scientific journey and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org backslash neurotransmissions and sign up for free. Also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get two. 200 percent off the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20 percent off the annual premium subscription thanks so much for watching this episode of neurotransmissions what'd you think if you like this kind of video let me know it was a long one so thanks for vibing with me thanks for vibing and keeping it tight <laughs> if you want to see more stuff like this put a comment with some other neurotech device or product that i should try out down below until our next transmission, I'm Ali Astrocyte, over and out.